Good morning, everybody. All right, let's stand and worship together this morning. doing this morning? Feeling okay? All right, everyone looks good. Everyone looks like they're kind of joyous. This uh, spring weather has finally decided to join us, which is kind of nice. I see some fist pumping back there, which is great. I think so. Well, it's going to be a great day at church. I just wanted to introduce myself. Uh, for those who don't know, my name is Lucas, and I'm the worship leader for our encounter service. Um, this is our our band. Uh, we may have seemed to have some drum issues starting off there, but we got them, we got them together. We doing okay back here, fellas? We'll figure it out. <laughs> technology, right? Does it, it doesn't even belong at church. Yes, it does, guys. It does. We <laughs> like technology. But it's great to have all of you uh, worshiping with us uh, this morning. Um, let's go to God in prayer as we continue in worship. Father, we just thank you for this time, Lord, just the ability um, to lift our voices, Lord, to, uh, to sing your praises, um, God, and it's just a joy to worship you. Father, we just ask that your spirit would fall on us, Lord, that we can experience you in a new and powerful way. Lord, and we just declare that our worship this morning is yours, and it's in Christ's name we pray, amen. my heart, Lord. Here's 
Just declare this in this place today. Cause I am found, I am yours, I am loved, I'm made pure, I have life, I can breathe, I am healed, I am. Come on, church. Cause you are strong.
just sing this chorus one more time. Just give our hearts over to the Lord this morning. Here's my heart, Lord. Lift your voice. Here's my heart, Lord. Here's my heart, Lord. Here's my heart, Lord. Speak what is true. You may be seated. Listen to these words from Psalm 139. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See me if there is any offense, offensive way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Amen. So this next song is called, um, it's called So High. And the idea behind this song is as we get into our, our new sermon series about um, having a big fat mouth, which um, I think some of us can kind of relate to that. The truth is, as much as we, uh, as much as we can have a big fat mouth and say things we shouldn't, um, there just are not enough words to describe how wonderful and how awesome God is. And so that's what this song is about, just not having enough words, believe it or not. So just kind of reflect on that as, as we sing in the... Uh, I hope that you feel the Lord's presence here this morning. are just words and are not enough to contain you. Jesus, just words and never suffice to reclaim you. Father, just words and I have so few. to you, Father, just words, and I have so few, I run out too fast to speak them to you.
painful sense of urgency to tell you that you are to me so high would you pray with me father you truly are indescribable there are times in our lives when we simply just don't have the words to express just how grateful we truly are. That when we begin to count our blessings truly, they are innumerable. And so, Father, we take this time to sing praises to you, to lift your name on high, to come before you as our King and our Lord. And Father, today we, we are here to lay our lives before you, to let everything else that would occupy our time, everything else that occupies our minds, to lay those things aside, that they would become less and that you would become great. And so, Father, in this time, as we are laid out before you, would you speak to us? Would you mold us? Would you help us see your will in each and every one of our lives? And, Father, may today as you speak to us, we not only hear you with our minds and with our ears, but also with our hearts and our souls. Here's our heart. And so, Father, take this time, consecrate it, and may it be glorifying to you. And it's in Christ's name that we ask all of these things. Amen. Well, welcome to the Encounter Service here at First Broad Street. My name's Harrison. I'm so glad that you have chosen to join us uh, this morning as we start a brand new series. Uh, called My Big Fat Mouth. And so I'm really excited about this. I think you'll have a lot of fun with this. Uh, but before we continue in worship, why don't you stand up, seek out someone you haven't seen in a while, tell them good morning, welcome to church. Good morning, welcome to church. Good morning, welcome to church. Thank you. Can you move my thing? I think Luke's going to get it. Hi, I'm Nathan. And I'm Misty. And, and this, this is Happenings, Happenings Live. I'm Nathan, the Executive Director here at First Broad Street, and we're so excited you're worshiping with us today. And I'm Misty, one of your pastors. 
Please take the time to take our attendance folders found in each row and fill that out. Also, if you're a visitor, we have some special information for you, and we have a welcome gift in the Welcome Center. Camp time is coming up soon, and Camp Bays Mountain is having a grand opening next Sunday, April 29th, in the afternoon. There'll be food and tours, and you can kick off the camp season by celebrating at the ribbon cutting of this new event. Also, there's still time to sign up for camp this summer, and First Broad Street folks get a significant discount. Please check in with your children's or youth minister to find out more. We have an exciting announcement today. Sissy Heaton has agreed to be our senior adult ministry leader, and she has so many wonderful ideas and a lot of energy to help us meet this need. Later today, we'll have a young adult cookout at Phil and Lisa Tensher's home. Bring your family and your favorite dish to share. Hope to see you there. For more information about everything happening at the church, check out our website at fbsumc.org or our Facebook page. Thanks again for being here. Have a great week. Strike me down if I lie, me no one be around when my tongue's untied. Every pot says it's okay. All the little things I say with my big fat mouth. La 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 Uh, this series today. Uh, but hopefully when you walked in, you grabbed one of these, a worship handout. Really invite you to get one. They're at the doors uh, if you need to get up and get one. On the back's a place for you to follow along with today's sermon. I really encourage you uh, to do that. I think God will speak to uh, each and every one of us in a very personal way. And some of you are in just the right place uh, today. Um, because we need to understand... That there is such power in the words that we speak. Our words have the power to give life. And our words have the power to take life. Jesus said it this way in Luke chapter 6. What you say flows from what's in your heart. So we're going to talk about the words that we speak. And we're going to try to see if we can't get them right. Because I've come to believe that the way that we use our words towards one another is one of the greatest, if not the greatest, issue in our culture. So we're going to be talking about sort of four big issues over the next four weeks when it comes to our big fat mouths. And today we are going to talk about criticizing. And next week, you're going to want to be here because Missy Belote is going to talk about complaining. And if there's anyone that had the right to complain over the past six months as she has battled cancer, it's Missy Belote. And she's going to sort of be sharing about that journey and sharing about complaining. And then the next, the last two weeks are going to be about lying and gossiping. But I want to introduce today's theme to you by sort of sharing with you about the very first time that I ever preached. So the very first time I ever preached, I was 19 years old. That's 11 years ago for some of you. Uh, and I was on staff at uh, Mountain View United Methodist Church. It's off Orbank Road here in Kingsport. And I was sort of a children and youth person, and the pastor there at that time was Larry Ramey. And uh, Larry was, he gave me a job that I wasn't at all qualified for, and then he gave me this opportunity to preach that I wasn't at all ready for. And so, good, good. And, uh, and so I sat down, I wrote the sermon, and uh, the sermon, I can't remember what it was about, but uh, I do remember... That night before, being so anxious about having to preach, I ended up just getting sick. And so I, so I show up that morning, and there's two services there, and I have a 30-minute window to preach. And when it came time to preach, I did what every person does when they have their sort of first public speaking engagement, and that is I spoke really, really fast. And that 30-minute sermon that I had planned for turned into about an eight-minute sermon, and I just, I ran out of stuff to say. And uh, so I just prayed, and I sat down, and it was really, really bad. Um, 
I'm glad that the technology wasn't in place to record it, so I would have uh, this reminder of how awful it was. But fortunately enough, Larry was on the front row, and he would constantly give me verbal cues that I was doing well. I like to call them the Baptist moans. So he was like, "Mm mm-hmm, all right, that's right, amen, you know, things like that. Well, after the second service, it finally ended, and, uh, you know, it's sort of a traditional church. You walk out, and your people are walking by as you're shaking their hands, and everyone was coming up to me telling me just how great of a sermon it was. You know, they were lying to me. We'll talk about that in a few weeks. Uh, But then I I remember distinctly one interaction. This uh, older lady walked up to me. She couldn't hear very well at all, and when you can't hear very well at all, you speak really loud, and this lady... Uh, was the church's rude, critical lady, all right? It's the type of lady who, you know, they're old, they're rude, they're critical. They exist in every single church, all right? And you can try to strike her down, but the devil will raise two up in her place. (laughs) Anyway, anyway, this lady came up to me, you know, all hunched over, moving slowly. She grabbed my hand with her two little freezing cold hands, like old women have, and... She, uh, <laughs> calm down, calm down, <laughs> calm down. So she walks by, she grabs my hand, you know, she's patting me on the hand, and she said this, I remember this very distinctly, son, you have a long way to go if you want to do that for a living. <laughs> and, then, and then she just walked on. And, of course, she said it loud, so everybody around her, you know, heard her. Um, All right, so today I want to talk about my big fat mouth, and our topic is the problem of criticism. Now, when I'm talking about criticism, I'm not talking about the constructive feedback that we give uh, because we care about people and we want to help them get better. What I'm talking about is the critical nitpicking, the unkind, uninformed, cruel criticism that so often goes on in our world, this huge issue of criticism. And some of you right now, you're in your seat smiling, going, oh, dear God, thank you. I need my spouse to hear this. Or I'm going to send this link to the sermon to my boss, or you're thinking about all the people that you cannot wait to hear this sermon. And if that is you, I want to remind you that this sermon series is called My Big Fat Mouth, not Their Big Fat Mouth. Because the problem with criticism is really difficult to see in the mirror. We hate it when people criticize us, but we often don't realize when we're criticizing others. Because when we criticize others, we often feel justified in criticizing them. Because if if they weren't so weird, if they weren't so stupid, if they didn't spend their money in such an unwise way, then we wouldn't criticize them, right? Because after all, we know what's best for their life. Right, you know, God has this wonderful plan for your life, and so do I. And so if you don't live up to my plan, I'm going to criticize the way you raise your kids. I'm going to criticize the way you dress. I'm going to criticize what you post on Instagram, how you drive, where you went for your last vacation, because I know you're in debt and that you can't afford that. You got quiet. I don't know where you are. Maybe this is hitting a little close to home. But I know that I struggle with this. And what I want to do to sort of begin is show you a very popular verse in the Bible. And even if you're not familiar too well with Scripture, you'll probably know about this verse. Uh, But then I'm going to share the verse immediately afterwards, and probably very few of you are familiar with this verse. And it comes from Galatians chapter 5, verse 14. In your uh, handout, it says Mark 16. That's incorrect. So it's Galatians chapter 5, verse 14. And Paul writes this. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. Right, we, we've heard that over and over and over, that we know that, it feels good, love your neighbor as yourself. But then the very next words, verse 15, if you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. Love your neighbor as yourself, but be careful if your words are constantly critical, if you're always cutting into people, if you're always harsh with the words. Be careful of destroying one another. 
What if for some of you, your critical words are actually destroying the potential intimacy you could have within your marriage? What if your critical words are driving a wall between you and your children? What if, what if those of you, your critical words are actually keeping you from sharing the goodness of Jesus because people can't get over how critical you are about anything and everything? Be careful that your words do not end up hurting those around you. Now, some people, they cut, they hurt, they criticize, but other people speak words of wisdom. They build up. They don't tear down. They create healing instead. Paul moves on in Ephesians chapter 4 and shares this. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. In other words, don't tear people down. Let the only words you speak be words that are helpful, be words that are building people up, be words that are encouraging to others. Because here's what I hope that you understand. You have no idea how a single word of criticism can pierce someone's soul and stick with them for years and years and years. And on the other side of that, you have no idea how God can use a single word of encouragement to build someone up, to give them the faith to go on. Friends, your words have power. The most untrue thing that perhaps has ever been said is what you say on playgrounds when your friends are mean to you. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. If anything, the complete opposite is true. Words have power. After that first sermon I preached, I remember Larry, he took me out to eat lunch, and the entire time we were eating, he was telling me, how great a sermon it was. That when he preached his first sermon, it was only like five minutes long, so I didn't need to feel too bad. And this man who I looked up to was in those moments speaking life into me. He was building me up. You have no idea how one word of criticism can take someone down and how one word of encouragement, how God can use that to alter the course someone's life and that one critical lady she was a life taker in that moment but larry in that moment was a life giver and here's my question to you which type of person do you want to be which type of person do you want to be there's two options really the first type is what i'm going to call a fault finder and a fault finder quite honestly is what most people are Right, Because of our sinful nature, because of our brokenness, we tend to look for what's wrong before we ever look for what's right. You can take a relatively good person, you can pick them apart before you ever get to lunch that day. Right? I don't like the way you walk, I don't like the way you chew, I don't like the jokes you tell, I don't like the way you snore, I don't like the way you breathe. Right? You've had that conversation. I can't believe the picture she posted on Instagram. She said she loves Jesus, right? Can you believe the way that they raise their kids? I mean, if they're going to raise their kids like that, they might as well just put them in prison now, right? I'm not judging. I'm just saying, <laughs> right? I, I can't stand the way they drive their car. They better take that Jesus bumper sticker off because they're being a bad witness, right? Whatever it is, it is easy to be a fault finder. And if you're a fault finder, let me remind you that in those moments, you're a lot like the Pharisees. Because that's exactly what the Pharisees did. Just one story, when Jesus was calling his first disciples, perhaps his most controversial choice of being a disciple was choosing Levi or Matthew. Right? Matthew was a tax collector. He was a Jew collecting money for the Romans. And he would scrape the top so that he would be wealthy as well. 
And so Jesus calls Matthew. Matthew says, okay. And then Matthew invites Jesus to join him and all of his tax collector buddies at his house for dinner. And this is what we read in Mark chapter 2. While Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. When the teachers of the law, who were the Pharisees, saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said to them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have come, not come to call the righteous, but sinners. That the Pharisees see Jesus doing something that they don't like, that they wouldn't do. And immediately, you can imagine the disgust in their mouths. And so they begin criticizing. And if you follow the story of Jesus, you see that they do it over and over and over again. And the reason why they were fault finders, the Pharisees and us, is because a lot of times, one reason is because we're full of pride, right? That we think we know what's, what's best. Another reason that we're fault finders is that sometimes we're insecure about something. And therefore, we, we end up criticizing people in the very area that we're insecure about, the things that are weaknesses in our own lives. The third reason is simply just because we don't understand, right? So often we criticize from a distance something that we know nothing about. A lot of times that happens in church. If you had context, you might, if you had the context, you might say that you understand. It's a lot of times uh, before you have children, it's what you do to parents who do have children, right? It's easy to criticize parents all day long for how they discipline their two-year-old in the grocery store. And the reason why is because before I had kids, I never knew what it was like having a two-year-old. And now I do have a two-year-old, and in a grocery store, you find out that you cannot negotiate with terrorists, right? <laughs> and, and you don't know that until you've been through it, right? That you, that you know this is bad parenting, but you just surrender, you give up take the candy, be quiet, right? You can have a pony, just get in the car, don't embarrass me. <laughs> Our small group was out last night eating at O'Charlie's, kids eat free. And so 10 of us, there are seven children, and uh, immediately walking in, we got there late, but I can imagine the hostess being like, oh crap. <laughs> they set us in the very back, and the entire time, it was chaos. It was just chaos. And I can imagine these kids went out, or I've, I think volunteer had their prom last night. There were all these kids dressed up for prom, and I can just imagine them. What are they doing over there with all those kids rambunctiously? It's so easy to criticize when you just don't understand. And when you criticize others, a, a lot of times what we're thinking that, well, this, this makes me look smarter, right? This makes me, I'm the expert in this area. This shows you just how good I am. But what it actually does is it makes you look insecure. It makes you look mean-spirited. And it makes you look angry. And ask yourself this. Have you ever met a critical person that you would like to be like? Have you ever met a critical person that you want to be like? Because for me, I've never met a critical person once that I want to be like. In fact, speaking of critical people, there's a verse in the Bible that's about this. And I'm going to show you this verse, and you may criticize me for bringing up this verse. But I want you to understand, this is the Bible. All right? And when, I, when I read this verse, some of you, what you're going to need to do, I'm going to give you instructions. Some of you, when I read this verse, you're going to need to look straight forward. You're not going to need to throw elbows. You don't need to increase your breathing. You need to stay very, very calm. This is not your place to do anything. God will do with this what God wants to do with this. It's all in the hands of God. All right? All right. So Proverbs 21, 19. Let's, let's, let me read this. You all don't say anything. Better to live in a desert than with a quarrelsome and nagging wife. This is the word of God for the people of God. <laughs> Thanks be to God. 
I put, uh, it says wife, folks. It says wife. <laughs> There's not a verse about men, but if I uh, ever get to add a verse to the Bible, I think Chelsea will ensure that it will say something like this, right? Better to get bamboo shoots in your fingernails than to live with a man who constantly picks you apart, right? It goes both ways. I've never met a critical person that I would like to be like or to be around. And so I want to ask you, those of you who, like me, have, have battled with a very critical spirit that it's so difficult to see in the mirror because we justify our criticism so easily. Do you want to be a fault finder or do you want to be the second option, a hope dealer? A fault finder or a hope dealer. In Romans 15, Paul says it this way. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Paul was a hope dealer. With every word that he wrote, every time he would speak, he wasn't going to tear people down. He was going to build them up. He wasn't going to let any unwholesome talk come out of his mouth, but only that which was helpful for building life into other people. He was a supreme hope dealer. In fact, if you read uh, just several things, I'm just going to take Romans chapter 8. I'm going to just share a few verses with you from that chapter. He says this, therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Jesus Christ. He said that the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. He said that Jesus is making intercession at the right hand of God the Father for us right now. That gives us hope. He said that you're more than conquerors through Christ Jesus. That gives us hope. He said that neither death nor life, neither demons nor angels, neither powers present or in the future, neither height nor depth, neither anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Every word there full of hope. Do you want to be a fault finder or do you want to be a hope dealer? The Pharisees were fault finders. Paul, Jesus, full of hope. Friends, let me say as again as we kick off this series... You have no idea how one word of encouragement, how God can use that to change a life. You have no idea when you speak the best about others, how God can build them up. Let no unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only that which is helpful for building others up. So your kid may not be the neatest kid, but she's got a great heart. Tell her, you're amazing. I love what I see in you. I love the way that you speak to others. Build them up. Right? Your wife may not be the most organized, but she's an incredible mom. Instead of picking her apart for what she's not, build her up for what she is. I love the way that you love our kids. I could have never married anyone That would impart more life into our children. Your husband may just have this huge honey-do list that never gets done. Right? The yard may never win yard of the month. Right? The yard looks kind of bad. But the next time he mows, you know, just say, gosh, Harrison, you're so sexy out there in your black socks pushing that lawnmower. (laughs) Right? (laughs) Words of life. Every single interaction that you have with every single person, you have an opportunity. You have an opportunity to speak words of life, or you have an opportunity to speak words that take life. In every interaction, in every conversation, you have the power to choose whether or not to be a fault finder or a hope dealer. And as we begin this conversation over the next few weeks, as we open up today, I just invite you to begin thinking about how in every situation 
you can make a difference. At the bottom of the card there, there are some questions to consider. And so I'll just read these as you can ponder these over the next week. Who are you most critical of? And what could your criticism be destroying? And the next, who could you begin dealing hope to? And how will you do it? Friends, the single thing, the way that you use your words, can have a huge impact on your life. It will have a huge impact in your relationships. And even if you have to speak words of life through, you know, a clenched mouth, do it. Because it's so, so worth it. Let's pray. Father, so often in our lives, we, we struggle to say the right things. So often in our lives, we, we're fault finders. Before we ever give someone the benefit of the doubt, we so often assume the worst. And so, Father, in these moments, we ask that you would speak powerfully to us. Because, Father, you are a hope dealer. As you speak to us, you encourage us. You help us know that the worst is not the last, the best is yet to come. You help us know, Father, that you are always with us. That nothing in this world, not even death, can separate us from your love. And so, Father, all of that hope that has been given to us, may that pour over in us. May that hope splash on everyone that we come in contact with. And so, Father, as we go into this week, as we go into speaking with family members, with spouses, with children, with parents, as we return speaking to fellow students and to teachers and to bosses and to colleagues. Father, we just ask that you would give us the strength, that you would give us the encouragement to be hope dealers and not fault finders. Father, all this we ask in the name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. I have, um, you don't have to play. <laughs> I have one more uh, announcement. <laughs> Today's a, sort of an odd day. I don't know if you've uh, picked up on that yet. But I, I have one more announcement before we uh, close our uh, time and close with a song. And as uh, most of you know, our lead pastor, Joe Green, he's retiring at the end of June. Uh, several of you known that for several weeks. A few weeks ago, our bishop of the Holston Conference, which our church is part of, uh, Bishop Mary Virginia Taylor, along with the appointment cabinet made up of district superintendents, uh, projected appointments beginning in July for all of our churches in the conference. And I'm very happy to announce to you that Reverend Dr. Randy Fry has been appointed to be our new lead pastor. And some of you know Randy very well because he was actually an associate pastor here uh, during the 90s. Uh, currently, he serves as the senior pastor at Fountain City United Methodist Church, which is, in, which is in Knoxville. Before that, he was the district superintendent of the Johnson City District. He's a phenomenal leader, and he's a great preacher. And I believe, along uh, with our church leadership council, that he'll be a great fit for First Broad Street. Uh, so I would ask of you that in the coming weeks that you'd be praying for him and his wife, Vicki, uh, as this transition happens. And then also uh, that here in a couple of weeks, Joe and Beth, they close on a house in, I think, Maryville, right? And before you know it, July will be here. So continue praying for them. On top of that, uh, a few weeks ago during spring break, Chelsea and I and some friends, we were vacationing at Hilton Head, and I received a very unexpected phone call informing me that beginning in July, 
I'll be taking leadership of a different church. And um, First Broad Street didn't ask for this change. I definitely uh, didn't ask for this change. I didn't think this would happen. <laughs> uh, but the appointment cabinet, Joe and uh, myself, as I'm uh, getting more acclimated to it, um, believes that I'll be a, a great fit at a church called Wheeler United Methodist Church. It's right across from the airport in the Northeast State. Um, several great opportunities at Wheeler that I'm really excited about. Uh, it's a healthy, growing church. has a lot of projected growth in the area uh, just in the next couple of years. But to tell you the truth, uh, as you can tell, it's, uh, it's heartbreaking. And I've been, uh, I've just been dreading it for weeks. Uh, First Broad Street, it's, uh, it's more than an appointment to me. It's family. My best friends are part of this church. And it is really hard to say goodbye. But have a lot more I'll say about it in the coming weeks. Uh, but just to let you know, my last Sunday preaching here will be on June 3rd. And my very last Sunday will be that following week, which is Meet at the Market. Uh, that's on June 10th. And so that will be a, a, nice, a nice way to wrap things up. And I would just ask for you, uh, of you, that you would pray for Chelsea and I uh, and Blair. And by that time, Ezra, as we make this transition. And just know this, that, that helping lead First Broad Street has one, been one of the greatest blessings of my life. And, and I, I truly believe that I'm leaving things much better than I found them. And I know that God is not finished here yet. Uh, Misty and Randy... We'll both be giving leadership to this service. I think you'll see people like Lucas and John Rowe uh, taking more leadership in the service as well. And if you have uh, more questions about that, uh, feel free to speak with Misty. She's here uh, right now. Uh, feel free to speak to Nathan for our executive director or anyone on the church leadership council. Their pictures are on the wall right outside this door. But what I do know is this, that the best is always yet to come. And together, as we seek to love God, as we seek to love others, I know God will bring his kingdom here. And so that's my prayer for you, and I hope that's your prayer for this church as well. So I'm going to pray for us, and then uh, we'll, we'll close in songs. During that time, as a response time, uh, I would invite you to come up with light candles, just simply as a visual reminder that God hears your prayers. There's uh, kneeling rails up here uh, for you to kneel and pray with. Uh, I'll be available after the service. I would ask that during this song, let's make this about Jesus and not about me. Uh, so, uh, yeah, just don't form a welcoming line for me uh, or anything. Um, but uh, I've still got several weeks, and we're going we're gonna to finish strong. So let's pray together. Father, we thank you for how your hand works. And Father, it's many times in our lives, it's when your hand works in unexpected ways that we receive the greatest blessings of our lives. And so Father, we pray that over these next weeks and over this time together, Father, that you move in a mighty way, that you speak to our hearts and that you continue to mold us more and more into the image of your son because father you know the plans that you have for this church you know the plans that you have for me you know the plans that you have for each and every one of us and our job is simply to say here I am send me and so father give us the courage to say yes to wherever you're leading us. Give us the courage in every interaction to be people of hope, to be people that deal hope, 
and to be people that give life. And so, Father, in these moments, encourage us. And it's in Christ's name that we ask these things. Amen.
Friends, would you please stand with me as we close out? And can we pray together? Father, truly, you are our living hope. We don't place our faith in people. We don't place our faith in governments. We don't place our faith in anything that this world has to offer. But, Father, we place our faith in you, knowing, Father, that the worst is never the last and that the best is always yet to come. And so, Father, go with us because you are our living hope. We can be hope dealers to everyone that we come in contact with. And it's in Christ's name that we ask these things. Amen. Thank you.